day the implementation of intervention was something I'll never forget. It was an experience of invasion. Some people were hiding in their houses. A lot of people were scared. We was all scared. There were some family members, especially, um, you know, a lot of our mothers ran up in the sand dune <laughs> and hide their kids. So you can just imagine they were reliving something they've experienced. people who are in control are the drug dealers and the petrol warlords and the pedophiles. To be an Aboriginal man in Murijolo, it painted a picture that everyone thought everyone was a pedophile in the community, every man. This community was functional, it was a happy community. Police were pulling up anyone from Murijolo, pulling the cars up, and at night the police were driving around the community all night with the two spotlights pointing into people's yards and windows and driving around all night with spotlights on. If you ask the question, what have they done? They've done nothing, you know, just damage. Ten years, a big, wider gap to what, closing the gap? Come on. Oh, the community's moving along good now, and we're still all here today, and we're still working with the government, anti-government and I don't know, Aboriginal people are looking after this place and we want to run it the way we see our communities. We want to empower our communities through, I don't know, our way, our way. The army came in early this year and they said sorry to us. It was the Australian army who came and said sorry and that was nearly Nine years later, they came and said sorry, and the federal police, anti-police, they've never said sorry to us or the government for doing what they've done to this community and accusing all the men and painting a very bad picture of the community. Yeah, it would have been nice if the government came back and said sorry. You know, that would be nice because it was their idea. You know, it was part of their, you know, policy procedure that they implemented. The reason I'm talking about uh, this particular story is because um, the ABC itself uh, says that this story sparked the Little Children of Sacred Report. The Little Children of Sacred Report, of course, is the basis for the Northern Territory intervention. Um, what I would suggest is, is probably the most racist, overtly racist, and disgraceful government policy of our time, certainly of my time. Uh, I can't think of a worse one. There's been some shockers in Australian history, the High Marsh Island Affair, um, the Native Title Act amendments, but I would suggest that the Northern Territory intervention uh, is the worst. Um, the United Nations certainly thinks so. So we're going to play the video uh, and then we'll come back and have a look. I'll, do an analysis. I'll give you an analysis of uh, why it's fraudulent. Tony Jones sets this up reasonably well, but you've got to remember Mal Gruff made a statement on ABC Late Line that everybody in uh, Central Australia knows who runs the pedophile rings. It caused an absolute shitstorm in the media for Mal Gruff. Uh, people made the obvious leap, if you know who runs the pedophile rings, why don't you jail them? Gruff uh, quickly backed down, but a month later, 
uh, this story appeared on Late Line, um, which purported to back up the claims of the Minister, the claims that pedophile rings were rife uh, throughout Central Australia. And for those who aren't familiar with the story, uh, the headline, the original headline on the story was sexual slavery reported uh, in Indigenous community. What I'm asserting is that the uh, ABC perpetrated a fraud, knowingly, and the, the government exploited that fraud. The program may contain images and voices of people who have passed away. Well, last month, the Crown Prosecutor for Central Australia appeared on this program and described in graphic detail the abuse of women and children in Aboriginal communities. Following that report, the Indigenous Affairs Minister, Mal Brough, appeared on Blake Line and made this extraordinary statement. Everybody in those communities knows who runs the pedophile rings. They know who brings in the petrol. They, knows who, they know who sell the gunja. They need to be taken out of the community and dealt, dealt with, not by tribal law, but by the judicial system that operates throughout Australia. Uh, I've you're going to re-watch little bits of it and I'm going to explain to you why they're lies. This was, this was in June 2006, in fact June 21, one year precisely to the day before they launched the Northern Territory intervention. Um, this story created another shitstorm in the media and it sparked the Little Children of Sacred Report. We were then contacted by some senior Aboriginal women who asked us to tell the story of a man who traded petrol for sex with young girls in the community of Mutijulu, home of the custodians of Uluru, and how other men in the community, many with convictions for violent crime, made it difficult for people to expose the sexual violence, the drug trade and the petrol trafficking. The six witnesses all tell the same story. It's a story of despair and addiction to alcohol, marijuana and petrol sniffing. The reason they took footage from everywhere is because, believe it or not, um, ABC Lowline never actually visited Mortadula in the lead up to the story. On any single occasion, they constructed the story from Alice Springs and from Sydney. Uh, they never set foot in a community uh, that they say they conducted a lengthy investigation into. To come across clear evidence of child abuse was terrible enough. It skips a little. But all the witnesses were shocked to discover that young girls in the community were being targeted by a predatory pedophile. It's true that there are predatory men in the central deserts, the people who are in control, uh, the drug dealers and the petrol lords and the pedophiles. I saw women come into meetings with broken arms or with screwdrivers or other implements through their legs. I saw um, four-year-old children gambling while they Sorry, I shouldn't make you stop that. Drinking in Alice Springs. I learnt of children as young as five who were watching pornography in abandoned houses while their parents were 200 kilometres away drinking. I mentioned to you to remember that graphic. That gentleman was identified in the story you'll recall as an anonymous uh, youth worker. Um, those of you who know this story will know he's never been a youth worker uh, in his life. He is in fact uh, Gregory Andrews, an assistant secretary or former assistant secretary in Malbruff's department. He has never worked as a youth worker. He did work in Mutajulu as a project worker, um, but he was an assistant secretary, the second highest rank in the minister's department. He appeared on ABC Late Line with the minister's full knowledge and permission. Um, it was the ABC's decision uh, ultimately to black his face out because he was asked to say certain things which he decided he didn't want to say. He was asked to say them by the government. There were some things he wouldn't say. Um, uh, so he had his face blacked out, but with the full knowledge of the Minister. Um, and it's worth noting the Minister uh, had claimed that uh, there were pedophile, everybody knew who ran the pedophile rings and pedophile rings were rife. Uh, he then backed away from those claims when he got in trouble with the media. This man, an anonymous youth worker, crops up uh, a month later on television and says, well, everything the minister said was right. Uh, but, of course, he works for the minister, uh, works directly for the minister. But Lightline made that. Lightline knew who he was. Lightline were planning to interview him in his office in Canberra at Faxi. Lightline did that. Lightline deliberately lied and called... Lightline admitted this. We, and a source inside the department who we were also... I won't necessarily say get to, but homes were raided, <laughs> is all I can say. 
Uh, the woman, uh, Munda Jarrah Wilson, hadn't lived in Mutajuli for seven years. Uh, she was commenting on Central Australia generally and Mutajuli seven years earlier. Uh, but she was portrayed as commenting on Mutajuli straight away. <laughs> they took footage from all over the place, stitched it together and portrayed it as Mutajuli. They got in trouble from the ABC Complaints Review Panel for doing precisely that. Um, but what, that, uh, what Gregory Andrews just told you, he saw women uh, coming to meetings with screwdrivers in their legs. Um, he repeated all sorts of extraordinary claims uh, in the course of um, his adventure. Um, he told a parliamentary Senate inquiry in a petrol sniffing that, that children, and, and I quote, children were hanging themselves from the church steeple on Sundays, plural. Never happened on a single occasion. Police have confirmed no child ever hung himself from the church steeple in Mutajuli. Uh, he claimed, told the Parliament, uh, that women and children were fleeing the community uh, and hiding in the sand dunes to avoid violent petrol sniffing men. Uh, the incident he's referring to was a sorry camp uh, where entire families left houses after a person, two people died in two separate houses, which is a common practice in Central Australia. He claims that he created employment for local uh, Aboriginal people at um, the local Yalara Resort. The Yalara Resort subsequently uh, claimed that didn't happen. When this story broke, Andrews was forced to write a letter of apology uh, to the Senate and apologise for misleading them. Um, but there was no sanction uh, brought against him. He was a very senior public servant who escaped unscathed. That's his apology right there. He also told the Senate, we'll get to this later, but he told the Senate um, that he lived in Mutajuli for nine months. Gregory Andrews never lived in Mutajuli for one hour. He never stayed a single night in Mutajuli. And in his letter uh, of apology to the Senate, he says, on page CA85 of the Hansel, I stated, I was at Mutajuli for about 18 months and lived in the community for about half of that time. He then says, it has come to my attention that I may have unintentionally misled the Senate purpose sniffing inquiry from 27 He inadvertently misled them and thought that he lived somewhere for nine months when he didn't. <laughs> That's quite an inadvertent misleading. Jane Lloyd manages the Domestic Violence and Child Abuse Service for an Indigenous women's group called the NPY Women's Council. On behalf of the council, she notified local police, the South Australian Government and the Northern Territory Government about the activities of the paedophile as recently as April last year. Her report to police alleges that he would give underage girls petrol to sniff in exchange for sex, and also noted that the first victim that we became aware of was a woman with acquired brain injury and a number of disabilities. And we know who she is. We have chosen to protect her identity. And this is her son, Little Warren, he was born with extremely high lead levels. No one knows who... Um, you'll note that this is just a media ethic issue, but you'll note the comment, uh, and we know who she is. Uh, we've chosen to protect her identity. They then depict her son, Little Warren, uh, in a community of 250 people. There's only one child uh, named Little Warren in the community of Mutajula, so they, everybody uh, knows uh, who this woman is. They didn't protect her identity at all. And why they crowed, we, ch we know who she is. I don't quite know why they <laughs> phrased it that way. Um, presumably they got very excited. But um, that's uh, the sort of thing you might expect to see from a current affair. Mother and son are the human faces of this tragedy. This is another. Frustrated by a lack of police action, Jane Lloyd trailed the pedophile as he cruised the community in his car. I followed him around just to see where he was going, what he was doing. It was unusual for me that, a, you know, the elderly senior man was just driving around by himself. I then saw police and I notified police of what I knew of him and police indeed followed him and later in the day they pulled him over and he had two young women, they were not underage, but two young women who, are known, who had known addictions to petrol sniffing in the back of his vehicle. Um, the police tried to interview the two women, but they were unwilling to disclose anything. If I can just summarise what she said. I trailed an elderly Aboriginal man driving around a community. Uh, the police pulled him up and he had two overage women in his car. I'm not quite sure <laughs> where to go with that, other than a man's driving around with two women in his car. There was a man who was preying on women. 
without question. But the last time I checked, it's not against the law to have sex with women over the age of 18. But it's it's men at a terrible personal cost. This is the youth worker. People who belong in these communities, they've got nowhere to go, so it's much harder for them to confront the perpetrators of the abuse. And you did try and confront people, didn't you? I did. I, what happened to you? Um, I, all of the incidents of um, sexual abuse and violence that I saw, I reported to the police. That's Gregory Andrews, the uh, Assistant Secretary. Um, Gregory Andrews never uh, made a single report to Northern Territory Police on any single occasion ever of sexual violence or abuse against Aboriginal children. Uh, he's just completely made that up. But watch what happens as he does make it up. He starts to cry. It's really hard, isn't it? Um, I, I was threatened when I returned to the community that I was working in the region. I was threatened with violence on a number of occasions. My wife was threatened and we were intimidated to the extent that while we were in hospital with the birth of our two-day-old child, we were receiving harassing phone calls from people who were trying to threaten and intimidate us to withdraw the, the statements that I'd made to the police. And did you withdraw those statements? I did withdraw the statements, yes. And is that your biggest regret? It's something that I've been thinking about a lot. It's something I've been thinking about a lot too because Gregory Andrews didn't make any statements to police about sexual violence against children or abuse. What he did do was complain to police that Leslie Calmer, who we heard at the end of the story, uh, had threatened him. The threat, which um, has been proven in a court of law, uh, was uh, after Gregory Andrews told a coroner that Mutajuli was a dysfunctional community, uh, Leslie Calmer rang up uh, Gregory, Andrews, Gregory Andrews and said, I shall throttle you. Uh, Gregory Andrews was 400 kilometres away at the time. Uh, that is the threat. Um, his wife was threatened. In fact, uh, his wife was caught stealing health records from the Mutajuli Health Clinic for the purposes of informing the government about what was going on in the community. She was caught in the act of stealing the health records and the threat against his wife was a threat that she would be exposed uh, for what she was doing. She worked at the health clinic part-time occasionally. Winter General Elder Bob Randall has come here to launch a documentary he has produced about his life. Though not a doctor, he was the director of the Mutajuli Health Service when it was placed under administration this year by the Commonwealth Government. Bob Randall, a long-time resident, plays down the notion that sexual abuse of children is rife in the community. Very little, you know, so I knew, you know, all those things were being talked about publicly. Uh, they have happened in the past in our community, but we're a very small in population and we're very strict with our discipline in our way. Uh, to anyone who acts those sort of non-acceptable ways. Uh, this, is, this is just another media ethic issue, but um, they interviewed uh, Bob Randall by phone. Uh, that's a cameraman sitting there um, conducting the interview. Bob Randall is in Melbourne. They told, told Bob Randall and Bob Randall's publicist that they wanted to speak to him about the film that he was producing or launching in Melbourne. And then they turned up and did a current affairs style ambush of an Aboriginal man uh, there to promote uh, a film about his life. Tony Jones didn't know about any of this before it was done. He knows, knew about it immediately after it was done and we'll get to what he describes as the best reporting late Ryan has ever done in this story. When you tell a big lie you've got to make some big statements. There is one up. pedophile and he relies on his kinship and ceremonial connections for protection. That's the issue you raised earlier. Lateline conceded quickly that there is, they knew of one pedophile in the Mutajula community. In fact, um, the evidence we have, which is overwhelming, is that the youngest woman this man uh, engaged in sexual intercourse with was 15. So he is technically uh, broken the law, absolutely. He's also a predator, no question. Um, but the sting in the tail is that this man left Mutajulu and was forced out by the community of Mutajulu seven months before 
Late Line aired its story and never, well seven months before Late Line never turned up in the community to research the story. He was forced out to the community of Armada seven months earlier than this story broadcast. There was no pedophile in Mordajuli when they broadcast this story. He was an Aboriginal elder. But the claim in the story is that uh, we know of one pedophile. He left seven months earlier and the story that they followed up after this um, tried to portray him having left Mordajuli as a result of this story. Uh, in fact, he left seven months earlier. ABC reported on June 22, the day after this story aired, after our story yesterday about petrol being uh, traded uh, for sex, the MT government has announced an inquiry, a six-month inquiry into, into uh, sexual abuse in Aboriginal communities. The, the, the Little Children of Sacred report was sparked directly because of this story. It was this story that sparked the report and then the intervention. In the Late Line asked Bob Randall whether he knew that his nephew Leslie Karma had a criminal record when he employed him at the Mutajulu Health Clinic. Leslie Karma is still working there as the driver. Yeah, I think uh, he, he, he uh, got a speeding fine, having a so-called unregistered firearm, you know, too busy loves his shooting. But he's not a criminal, he's just another man doing what little he can to, you know, look after his family like all of us. Susie Smith, the journalist, says, in fact, Leslie Kalmer has two criminal convictions for assaulting a female. The criminal convictions that Leslie Kalmer has, and Lateline claimed to have his criminal record, so they knew this, <coughs> are 30 years old when they broadcast them. They're spent convictions, they're, they're older than 30 years old, they're about 32 years old. They were spent convictions three times over. It was illegal to even mention them. Um, the assault against the female was <coughs> Still an assault, there's no excuse for it, but it was done when he was a very, very young man, 30 years earlier. Susie Smith is the journalist who... You know, yep, she's still there. Okay. Yeah, I'm the spin doctor, she's the journal. We both won uh, our Walkley at the same uh, event, ironically enough. And look, it's a long story, but my house got raided by the Australian Federal Police over some leaked documents. Her husband was running... Uh, they had tapped my phones and, her, and we put in a Freedom of Information request in to prove that they had, they refused to release the information. They would merely indicate they weren't going to tell us how they surveilled us. Um, the lawyer who ran our Freedom of Information case was her husband. He dumped it when we broke this story. <laughs> so the FOI has never been uh, action. It's a small world. Have you rescued now? I think they, I think they can and um As human beings. Yep. <laughs> they have a, have a right to be rescued. I only, uh, I only played that because he was crying again and I love the footage. There's no, I have no comment on that other than what an idiot. This is the bit where it gets really scary. Now after this story, um, they broadcast, when we broke the story about Gregory Andrews being not an anonymous youth worker but in fact a very senior official in Mount Ruff's department, pretending to be someone else on a television program backing what the minister had said. Leyline's response was to admit the fraud but claim that it didn't destroy the story because the doctor in the community, Jeff Stewart, who you saw briefly, um, he said the same things uh, and he's a credible man. So. Uh, uh, the, the whole story doesn't collapse. Fair enough, Gregory Andrews is a mark, but uh, the rest of the story doesn't collapse. Um, they then did a lengthy interview with Jeff Stewart after this program, in which he basically said that uh, Aboriginal men in the community, he backed up everything that everybody else said, Aboriginal men in the community created an environment where this pedophile was protected, uh, where his actions were sanctioned and, and where authorities were frustrated in trying to stop this man sexually abusing uh, Aboriginal women. Now I'll give you a very quick uh, play of what Jeff Stewart had to say. Well this was in 2003 actually when this doctor was in Mutajulu four or uh, three years before uh, the story well, Dr Jeff Stewart has spent the past 13 years working in Indigenous Health in the Northern Territory he served in community controlled Aboriginal medical services and government based remote clinics and was the doctor at Mutajulu from 2000 to 2003. He's seen firsthand the problems faced 
in those communities. And I recorded this interview with Dr. Stuart in Darwin. We're almost we at the end, message We've heard now from a number of people, uh, purely and simply, that he was procuring very young women and offering them petrol for sex. Is, it, is that how you understand it? Yeah. Yes. As simple as that. Yeah. And how was he able to, to get away with this uh, in a very tight-knit community like this must have been? Well, he, he was well known for the behaviour and, and he had a history going back into previous communities. Um, if I could just say, if he looks nervous answering that question, We'll come back to why. He'd handled the interview very well up to that point, but he got a little bit anxious at that question. How was he able to get away with it? In the AP lands, and he would be seen, you know, driving a vehicle with with um, or other girls off into the bush, and um, I mean, lots of ways it was very open, and um, the the community was. It actually sounds almost brazen, uh, in, in a way, the way you put it. Well, it was certainly not cleverly concealed. Um, I mean, it was, it's, it's a scenario that evolved over the time that, that I was in Wurijulu and, and, and became aware of it um, and got bits of, you know, people started confiding more of the story and, and of his history and, uh, until I became fully aware of, of what was going on. Was he, in a sense, protected by other senior men in the community? I mean, they must have also known what was happening. Well, yes, and I mean, I made attempts at trying to deal with it at a community level. I mean, I've, I worked for a community-based, um, community-controlled health service, and my... I'll let him keep talking. Um, he, so he, you've heard him back up the, the claims. How did he get away with it? Well, it was pretty brazen. Um, but yes, other men in the community protected him uh, and that's how he was able to get away with it. We were, in the course of our investigation into their investigation, we were leaked uh, the health records of the alleged pedophile. Um, uh, we've obviously altered them so that he can't be identified. We've never identified who this old man is, and neither is late mine. Uh, this is an excerpt of his actual cover sheet of this old man's uh, health records, uh, which are the notes that doctors keep whenever they do anything. Now, it might be a little bit hard uh, to read, but that writing there, uh, and with the circle around it, um, uh, is Jeff Stewart's writing, the doctor's writing. Um, he has a discussion with um, the old man about Viagra. The old man is uh, wanting to use Viagra. Jeff Stewart has a lengthy discussion with him about it and then begins prescribing um, Viagra to this old man. Um, he continues to prescribe Viagra for some time. I don't know that you can uh, read it, but that circle at the bottom there says discussed Viagra. You can see BP down there, it talks about Viagra. And that circle right at the bottom there is, his, uh, is a script here. He issues him a script for Viagra. Who's paying for this? Uh, the government's paying for, for the Viagra. You can see the three exclamation points on the side. This is uh, Jeff Stewart writing in the health records again. Uh, it, re it reads, is using Viagra to have sex with young females. Um, so the Viagra that this doctor prescribed, uh, he's then using uh, in the doctor's mind uh, to sexually abuse young females. Um, this is a doctor who said on national television that it was men who created an environment where this abuse was allowed to occur. But it gets worse. Having written in his health records he's using Viagra to have sex with young females, he continues to prescribe Viagra to this man. You can see it down there again for another eight months. <laughs> he's more than an accessory. Uh, and there he is again, prescribing more Viagra. Uh, for another eight months, script for Viagra, or Sildenfil it's called, he continues to prescribe Viagra, having already identified that this man is abusing young women. And then the penny drops. He writes a long explanation about why he was prescribing Viagra to a man who was sexually abusing, uh, in his mind, uh, young women. 
uh, and, and says that the, the man's not to get any more Viagra. He leaves the community and a new doctor starts prescribing Viagra to this old man. It's now 2003. Um, he noted in 2001 uh, that the man was using Viagra to have sex with young females. This is two years later. They could. In fact, the main uh, woman was 29. But he did, he did uh, have, at the very, he did have uh, sexual relations with a 15 year old girl. Um, there's another note that we know of. Uh, there may have been more. I'm not suggesting he's not a predator. He absolutely was. Um, but he's a predator ably assisted by the medical profession. There's some more notes about uh, Viagra. We're now in 2004. That's another script uh, for Viagra. Um, and two years later, this doctor goes on a national current affairs, current affairs program and blames the Aboriginal men uh, in this community for uh, the sexual abuse uh, perpetrated in Mutajulu. The question in a media sense is, did Lightline know that Gregory, uh, Jeff Stewart was prescribing Viagra to this old man? Because if they did know, then the fraud they have perpetrated is quite extraordinary because they've gone, put him on television knowing full well that in fact he was the man who created the environment where this old man was able to abuse women. We were never able to prove the late line knew uh, uh, about uh, the Viagra until the other night when I was putting this video together. That uh, is a screen grab that you saw earlier which I mentioned to you you should remember. On that screen grab uh, it's a leaked report that late line got a hold of uh, which took uh, from Jane Lloyd, uh, the women's uh, health worker who writes to the government about the situation in Mutajula in, in 2003. In it, she refers to, you can see the words Viagra appearing in the, in the text. Jane Lloyd leaks this report to Lateline. Lateline put it up on the screen, but they never told anybody what it said. What it said is, um, amongst other things, Information that a recent medical officer employed at the Montejulo Clinic was making Viagra available to the man against the wishes of other medical staff. Um, they acknowledge throughout this report that um, it was the health professionals at the Montejulo Clinic who were prescribing Viagra. They then put a doctor on who was the doctor during this time and he's not asked that we can see by late line was he prescribing Viagra uh, to the man. He's simply asked is it men, violent men in this community who created this environment? The doctor replies, yes. Uh, so the fraud um, by late line is quite staggering. When this blew up, it became an issue in Parliament for some weeks. The stakes were very high. Suzanne Smith uh, stood aside from late line for some uh, quite a lengthy time. Tony Jones, uh, the, the complaint was investigated by the ABC. The ABC found uh, absolutely nothing wrong. The only offence that Lateline committed was using uh, the stock footage from Roper River without identifying it. Uh, they committed no other problems according to the ABC's complaint review panel. Um, Tony Jones commented this year on um, uh, Q&A that this reporting uh, was the best reporting Lateline has ever done. It's the reporting of which he is most proud. The reason he says that is because it is well known in the media that this story is very, very problematic for the ABC. Um, in terms of the washer, and I've got to wrap up because it really is going over time, um, Gregory Andrews uh, uh, quit the public service and is now the CEO of Indigenous Community Volunteers. Yep. ICB. Uh, he is the anonymous youth worker. Andrew has avoided further parliamentary scrutiny because this became an issue in the Senate Estimates hearing. He's become the first and only public servant to avoid appearing before a Senate Estimates hearing on the grounds of stress. Um, Malbruff and the Howard government were still in power at the time, so they prevented him from appearing on the grounds that he was too stressed to appear. An Aboriginal woman, Janara Green Green, who I'm told spoke at the New Way Summit uh, in Canberra. Um, her home was raided by the Australian Federal Police. Um, she was suspended from a job. She was suspected of being the leak to me in the National Indigenous Times. Um, she was charged with, I don't know what she said at the New Way Summit, so I'm not going to uh, confirm or deny, and I never do anyway, but um, 
Uh, she was suspended from a job, fined $1,000, convicted in the end of uh, inappropriate disclosure of public information, and she spent more than $70,000 in legal fees and is still trying to pay off the bill today. Um, Bob Randall's home, you saw Bob Randall, his home was also raided by the Australian Federal Police, uh, looking for evidence of leaks to the National Indigenous Times. They never found any. Susie Smith took uh, the journalist who uh, did the story, took a long a break from the ABC, but has returned now as the online investigations editor. Uh, the pr producer of the story, Brett Evans, is still with Lateline, although he did serve a stint with Media Watch. <laughs> Oh, the irony. Tony Jones uh, is obviously still with Lateline and, as I said, uh, describes this story as the reporting they are most proud of. Um, the ABC entered uh, a series on Central Australia in the Walkley Awards. Um, they removed this story from the series before they entered it. Uh, it didn't win, given the controversy surrounding the story, but it did go on to win a Logie, which I think is bloody appropriate, <laughs> uh, given the fiction. This, uh, this story was also removed, but the series around this story won a logie. But the victims of, um, of this whole saga are, of course, the Aboriginal men, women and children in the Northern Territory, who now suffer uh, the Northern Territory intervention as a result of this story. So I can tell you, you've probably spoken about this at length, but I'll give you the very brief official statistics. Um, malnutrition rates are now up in Aboriginal communities. Despite what the Minister says, their, her own report uh, two weeks ago confirmed Malnutrition rates have increased under the intervention. Um, school attendance has decreased. Less children are going to school. The $670 million housing program, $200 million spent, no real new houses. They say seven, but they haven't built any. Uh, suicide and self-harm incidents in the intervention communities went from less than 100 in the year prior to the intervention to more than double in the year after the intervention. Um, child welfare officials found no evidence of increased levels of child sexual abuse in Northern Territory Aboriginal communities. They did find some evidence of increased levels of child neglect, which you would be surprised if there wasn't. It is a third world uh, series of communities. Um, despite being given unprecedented coercive powers, the Australian Crime Commission has twice reported to government that there is no evidence of organised pedophile rings in Central Australia or in any other Northern Territory Aboriginal communities. In terms of questions, did the story spark the intervention? Yes, it did. I, we won't go in to show you the, the story, but take it from me. The ABC reported the following day that they sparked the Little Children of Saga report. Um, did Lateline know Gregory Andrews was not a uh, Aboriginal youth worker? Yes, they did know all along. Um, did Lateline believe Gregory Andrews was a credible witness? Both Jeff Stewart, the doctor, and Jane Lloyd, the women's health worker, warned the ABC not to put Gregory Andrews on prior to the story going to air. They did it anyway. And as to what did the ABC do, which was the question earlier, um, they've done nothing to correct the record. Um, the issue of Viagra being prescribed by the doctor has never been reported by a single ABC outlet anywhere in the country at any time. Uh, it was widely reported um, in News Limited papers, of course, because it's Viagra and sex, uh, but no ABC uh, organisation has ever reported it. And the PM program, which promoted this story heavily in its lead-up, I phoned them and said, are you going to report uh, the Viagra story? They laughed and suggested I ring Lightline. Um, and by way of wrap-up, um, Media Watch has never published a syllable of the story. Media Watch uh, is in the same area, as Lightline at the ABC in NewsCAF. Uh, when I rang them and asked them if they intended to publish anything on this, uh, they suggested that uh, National Indigenous Times and Crikey were doing an adequate job. So they never published a word. The Australian Communications Media Authority, uh, there's a complaint being developed for them now, but the community uh, was basically shut down by the government as a result of this story. They lost all their funding and all their control. Look, the story has been published, um, but mainstream media don't want to face it. They just don't want to know about it. it this is the, one of the biggest names in the ABC. The point being, you know, this, this talk was supposed to be about racism in the media, and I'll wrap up by saying, this is not a current affair, this is not today, tonight. This is ABC, late line, the flagship current affairs program of this country. If this can happen at ABC, late line, imagine what can happen uh, elsewhere.
appears there's a conspiracy of silence about it. Yep. The ABC has refused steadfastly to face this issue. Uh, they ran it through the Complaints Review Panel and, as I said, found absolutely nothing wrong with the story other than the use of the file footage from Roper River, which should have been labelled. I think you'll find Jeff Stewart will never cooperate with media ever again. Uh, Jane Lloyd, I, I, I don't know, but Gregory Andrews is traumatised by the event. <laughs> there's going to be a complaint to ACMA, the yeah. Communications Media yeah. Authority. Yeah. Uh, there's some lawyers and, uh, and myself working on it, but um, it's very hard to... when these, these are the people that control uh, what you hear, so it's very hard to get them to do the right thing. Yeah, look, and in opposition, because this story broke when they were in opposition, they were, Labor was all over this story, outrage, outrage, outrage. They were absolutely furious about it. In government, they've had nothing to say about it. And in fact, Gennaro Green Marin was prosecuted when the Rudd, after the Rudd government came into power. Oh, look, the question of why, sorry, why did they do this? There is a very simple answer for why they did this story. They had already got a lot of media interest when Annette Rogers... Um, the Central Australian prosecutors spoke about sexual violence in Aboriginal communities. Uh, this was done for one reason and one reason alone. It was done for a Walkley Award. The journalists believed that she would get a Walkley Award if she continued, and she was going to get one. Gennaro Goreng Goreng, G-O-R-E-N-G-G-O-R-E-N-G, Goreng Goreng. She was a, she worked with Gregory Andrews uh, in Faxia when all this occurred. She worked directly to him and uh, she was, fingered early on by the government as being my source. Um, they never uh, proved that. Uh, they convicted her for leaking information to her daughter about a school project. It was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, that's all they could get her on. This did create the environment uh, where the Northern Territory Convention was brought in. By, by, in my view, a long way, the most racist policy this government has ever done, the most shameful uh, thing this government in my lifetime has ever done. The really disappointing thing from my perspective is that it's been done in my name and it's been done in your name as well. It's been done in everybody's name supposedly to protect the women and children but it was done for entirely different reasons and uh, I think if we let it stand uh, it diminishes us all. Dave Tonner. Right. Let's, put, let's put some things into context here. Uh, Tony and I do acknowledge your role uh, in the intervention. I mean, it was your show. I had I no think. role in the intervention. Oh, no, no. That no. Was